Hello everyone, Lucas Macintosh here and I'm back with another edition of my retro video game room where I take a look back at games that are seen to be oddities or strange ports of established video games that may have gone under the radar by some and potentially deserve some much needed attention and analysis. This time I'm checking out Sonic the Hedgehog 1 and 2. No, not these games, I'm talking about the 8-bit versions developed especially for the Sega Master System in the early 90s. I know what you're probably going to say, Lucas, why are you wasting time reviewing these games? Why not just review the awesome top tier 16-bit versions? After all, they are the originals and the best ones to play. Well, maybe so, but I have always had a fascination with 8-bit Sonic games, and the few I played seemed to go off in their own direction, offering the players unique level design, bosses and gimmicks. And it felt that just like the 16-bit Sonic games that had their own timeline, then the 8-bit Sonics seemed to have one too. There were a lot of Sonic games in the 90s, especially with Sega's Game Gear which seemed to have the most games. Sega realised that Sonic was an icon and did its level best to ensure the Hedgehog appeared in many forms. This included not only platform games but also kart racing and even pinball. There are also actually a few reasons why I decided to concentrate solely on the Master System versions of Sonic 1 and 2. Number 1. I could easily do a review of Sonic 1 and 2 on Mega Drive, but to me, that would just be, again, too easy. I've probably said it before, but you don't need me to tell you how good these games are, and there are many informative and talented individuals on YouTube who have reviewed them. Honestly, I do love these games. The problem is, again, using that word, it would be far too easy, and I would just end up gushing all over them, declaring them as incredible titles, and the review would be just too easy. Number 2. I didn't get the Mega Drive or Genesis until much later and so I grew up with the 8-bit versions of Sonic 1 and 2 and would play them frequently. I even got to experience Sonic Chaos at a friend's house and we both beat it having acquired all the emeralds. Ok, so admittedly Sonic Chaos is an easy game but as a kid it was one hell of an achievement for me and one of my fondest memories. 3. Because I played so much 8-bit Sonic, that's what I knew the series for, and when I eventually got round to playing Sonic 1 and 2 on the Mega Drive, which my family acquired quite late in its lifespan, I have to say I wasn't really that wowed, as the Sonic I knew was slowed down and in 8-bit, and that's what I was kind of used to. It was really hard to accept at the time that Sonic, especially in the second game, moved much faster than his Master System counterpart. My final reason is that a lot of people legitimately hate the second Sonic 2 release for Sega's 8-bit wonder back in the day. This was due to bad hit detections and awkward level gimmicks and not being able to play his tails, despite him appearing in the title cards. So I hope that my review of this game may help you change your minds, or at least soften many of the criticisms that I received for this title. It's probably clear to you now that I'm absolutely fascinated with Sonic in 8-bit and the many games that were made. After Sonic the Hedgehog was released on the Mega Drive or the Genesis, Sega wanted to market Sonic to everyone and so commissioned Ancient Software to make 8-bit versions of the popular game. This was not only a chance to show that even if Sonic was slowed down the games would still be good, but it was also a shrewd marketing decision. At the time Sonic was huge and I don't think there was a kid or adult who didn't know who he was. This game took everyone by surprise. Sega knew that there were a lot of people who still had the handheld Game Gear and or the Master System and may have not yet upgraded to the Mega Drive. So by releasing 8-bit Sonic games on these systems it would encourage them to upgrade to the 16-bit hardware to play the graphically superior and faster versions. It was a really really good move and one that paid off incredibly well. However, with the 16-bit Sonic sequels came more 8-bit versions ported for the Master System and Game Gear. Sega wanted to win the bit wars against Nintendo and were pushing lots of Sonic games. Over the coming months, I'm going to try and review as many as I can because there's loads I just haven't played. And I'm curious because it's almost again like the 8-bit games are an alternate Sonic timeline. And I'll say straight off that the first 8-bit Sonic games were corkers, but the developers Ancient, who worked on the first one, did not work on the sequel. But they did set a standard for Aspect of Japan, 
who were the developers who developed Sonic 2 to follow. It's important to recognise that Sonic the Hedgehog has skills. Skills which he has acquired over a long period of time. Skills that make him a nightmare for the enemies that he encounters and also Robotnik himself. Alright, that's a Liam Neeson quote, but you, you know what I mean. Sonic can spin attack, curl in a ball and roll towards any foes that get in his way. He can jump up to higher platforms and he has the most important element which is attitude. These all make Sonic a force to be reckoned with. The blue blur must put all of these skills to good use in order to stop Robotnik. He must work his way through six zones that take him from the peaceful green hills, through a dangerous collapsing set of bridges, jumping carefully into a lush green jungle, swimming with killer robots in a crazy underwater death maze, racing through an industrial gimmick filled trap, and finally the game culminates in two very dangerous levels in the sky before a showdown with Robotnik in his doom ship. Each zone is comprised of three acts, with the third act of each zone, apart from Scrap Brain, featuring a boss encounter with the Twisted Doctor, who will try and defeat Sonic using one of his many inventions. It is only when Sonic has beaten every zone and defeated every version of Robotnik, then the game will be completed. Although this game borrows some elements from the Mega Drive version, this 8-bit Sonic is not capable of blast processing and being able to masterfully speed through each zone. This is not a put down whatsoever as the developers realised this early on and made the game more akin to be like a Mario title where despite the reduction in speed, Sonic can still run, jump, collect items and can work its way through each level, reaching the sign at the end in order to finish it and move on to the next. Sonic starts his quest with three lives and in order to stand any kind of chance later in the game he will need to boost this amount. Luckily there are a few things in the game that can help him to do that. Ok, so let's first talk about the six zones that Sonic will be platforming his way through. There are a few zones that share the same name and design with the Mega Drive version but essentially have different layouts with only really the Labyrinth zone being almost the same. Apart from that, there are three exclusively designed zones not seen in the 16-bit version. The first zone is the Lush Green Hill, which serves as kind of an introductory set of levels to allow players to ease into the game. There are a few hazards, such as spikes, moving platforms and enemies littering each stage, but nothing that players won't be able to handle. The second level, or act as the game calls it, has Sonic go underground where he must work his way back up towards the surface. I would say this is the hardest of the two levels purely because there are a few nasty flying baddies that can catch you unaware as you try and manoeuvre Sonic to the left. Once topside there are plenty of rings to reward you before hitting the signpost at the end. I should mention that the third act of every zone apart from Scrap Brain, which only has two acts, is a boss fight with the protagonist Dr. Ivor Robotnik and one of his many inventions. The act starts with Sonic trying to reach him and Green Hill is no exception. There are no rings to help you here and so unless you have a shield power up then you only really have one hit and must pull a Robotnik multiple times until he flies away. One advantage Sonic has is that in these boss fights is that there is no time limit so there's plenty of time to learn the patterns which gets slightly more complex the further Sonic gets through the game. The first fight in Green Hill Zone is pretty easy, with Robotnik flying back and forth. Simply wait till he starts to get low to ground and spin attack him a few times. Now the thing about these fights, and this is crucial, is you can't just pummel Robotnik repeatedly. I tried this and ended up losing a life. It's almost like the Doctor is only vulnerable at certain times and will turn invincible after a while. Sonic will need to hit and move where possible, and this is the same on every fight. Luckily, this first battle is not too challenging and once Robotnik has bitten the dust, Sonic must then jump on a plunger to release some cute animals trapped by the Doctor, then it's on to the next zone. Bridge Zone Now this is the first of the original zones made especially for the game by Ancient and features a lot of bridges with fish flying up and down. Scales which require momentum to propel Sonic to higher platforms, a very familiar body for the Mega Drive version and some tricky jumps across water filled gaps. Whilst the first act is not that challenging and simply by timing Sonic's movements slowly will get you through, the second act is an auto scroll level where the screen pushes the blue blur forward. This forces him to have to react quickly to obstacles that are in front of him. Now thankfully the obstacles are pretty much the same, but it's all about trying to balance Sonic and not letting the screen push him too far as it can be easy to panic when this is happening. Also these collapsing bridges must be tackled with care, keep your cool and you'll make it to the signpost. 
Act 3 is the second Robotnik boss encounter. This time he will emerge from either the left or right sides on the water. Sonic must hit him once and then get out of the way, as the Doctor then throws three fireballs at our hero which need to be dodged. All you gotta do is just keep hitting him again. Once again this fight can be a pain as it often feels like he will never perish. However, hang in there, keep using the repetition, avoid those fireballs and victory will be yours. The next zone takes place in the jungle and features two very different contrasting acts to traverse through. The first act is definitely a step up for what Sonic dealt with in the bridge zone with tricky jumps, bottomless pits and multiple logs falling from waterfalls. It's much easier to slip into the water here if Sonic takes a misstep or if his jump is not high enough. Plus there are more fish leaping about which can either be destroyed or avoided. It's a really good looking zone and I was suitably impressed by the amount of detail that went into it. Now provided you can survive the first act, the game once again throws you into a situation where the screen can potentially kill you. This time it's lethal. Sonic's task is to climb up to a massive waterfall which on its own is challenging. Now whenever Sonic moves upwards on the various platforms the screen moves up and for the most part if Sonic tries to go back down, even if there is safe ground below, it becomes a bottomless pit and Sonic will die instantly. I'm not a huge fan of this stage to be fair and find the gimmick not so much frustrating but a little bit unnecessary. I do feel that the level on its own is a lot better and I believe that in the Game Gear version of Sonic this was left out. Still it's not a complete game breaker but when you see a load of rings that you are unable to collect because you accidentally went up and bear in mind even if there is a smidge in a safe ground you will just die instantly which makes no sense at all to me. Now we move on to Act 3 and this time Robotnik has come prepared. You must spin attack the Doctor again cautiously as he throws out these ball projectiles that can easily knock Sonic and wipe him out quickly. The idea is you need to hit Robotnik once, dodge the ball which moves left and right until Robotnik then produces another ball. Now you need to avoid this second ball and hopefully it should run into the first one which will destroy them. Confused? I know I am. Now you need to quickly hit Robotnik again. Repeat this until you have beaten him. Now a quick tip, once he's beaten do not rush to the right until the doctor has rushed away because the screen will not allow you to continue until he has done that and you may end up slipping off the edge and having to do this frustrating fight again. This can be challenging first time round but once you have figured out the knack then it's less of an obstacle. The fourth zone is the slow trap laden labyrinth zone. Sonic must now spend most of his time underwater here dodging Robotnik's evil robots, spear traps and Sonic's reduced movements. Now this zone is almost exactly the same as the Mega Drive version but it is not as frustrating. As you can see Sonic's moves are extremely restricted and slow and in order to successfully get through the first two acts you must try and get through efficiently. Also bear in mind that Sonic needs to use air bubbles strategically placed at various points throughout the levels in order to help him breathe underwater. Luckily you do get a warning when this is about to occur with a generous 5 second timer which to be honest is longer than you think so you have plenty of time to try and get to a bubble. Ensure that you dodge the statue heads, projectiles and enemies if you can and you should make it through ok. The third act is another Robotnik boss fight and is nowhere near as difficult as the tense and spammy encounter found in the 16-bit version. The whole battle takes place underwater and don't worry, for some reason the game does away with air bubbles on this act so at least you can focus solely on the battle ahead. What you need to watch out for with Robotnik this time is the fact that he rises from the bottom shooting fireballs at our hero. Then he will appear from either the left or right hand side of the screen, descending. This is where you need to hit him, however again just hit him once and move across to the other side of the screen. The reason being that Robotnik will start to fire a homing missile and if you try and spam him with hits the missile could potentially wipe you out and you will lose a life. Trust me this game hates it when you try and hit Robotnik multiple times. Potentially if you're quick enough you could probably get in two hits but you must be so precise to the absolute second as once he starts to fire that missile then he will be invincible for a little while. This seems to be a common occurrence of on all Robotnik encounters so just stick and move and be patient and you will beat him. Honestly spamming him over and over is just not worth it. The fifth zone is called Scrap Brain and again it's really cool that Ancient decided to try and make an 8 bit version of this memorable Mega Drive zone. 
It's not as difficult as you would expect and all three acts are all slightly different. The first is really simple, all you have to do is go from left to right, watch out for the moving tyres on these platforms, pushing slightly forward, the electricity emanating from these annoying little devices and of course the fire being produced at various points of the ceiling. You may get caught out a few times but this act can be done quite quickly. Now the second act is a pain because there's much more of a puzzle element and also the stage does have multiple areas for Sonic to go to. It can be easy to get lost and confused for first timers as it's not always obvious what the blue blur has to do, particularly when it gets to this point here when there are two doors and only one will open with the other being inaccessible until a second switch is pushed near to where Sonic needs to go. So you have to push one switch that closes one door but opens another. Very, very confusing indeed. This whole level is annoying, but it's getting closer and closer to the final zone. Act 3 strangely does not feature a boss fight with Robotnik and essentially acts as kind of a small level with a few secret routes where Sonic can get his hands on some rings. He can pretty much go anywhere on this stage, but there are plenty of dead ends. It's nowhere near as bad as the last stage in my opinion. But when Sonic reaches his arch nemesis, a very short chase ensues, and Robotnik jumps onto a small platform to the next zone, where Sonic soon follows him. Okay, now for the final set of levels, and oh boy, Ancient decided to really punish the player here. This time, it's another exclusively designed mass system zone called Skybase. The first act is easily one of the most frustrating because it features tricky lightning patterns that go on and off intermittently, small platforms to hop across and also lots of pitfalls. Not to mention this guy who makes a return from the labyrinth zone and you have to wait for him to edge closer so Sonic can get past. Also towards the end are small flying platforms that have to be jumped in conjunction with avoiding that bloody lightning. My first few times on this stage were extremely rage inducing and it took me a while to work out how to dodge the lightning, plus whenever Sonic takes damage from it, it pushes him back and potentially can cause him to fall off and die. If he has no rings or if the platforms are too small, then this could easily happen. As a kid I could never do this level and did feel that this was overkill. Still it can be done with perseverance, the key is working out the timing of these patterns of the lightning. Once you know when it flickers on and off then things become a little easier and you can just focus on getting to that signpost. Act 2 is just insanity, you must climb aboard Robotnik's airship which I'm sure has been mentioned by other reviewers is very reminiscent of the Doom ships in Super Mario Bros. 3 for the Nintendo Entertainment System and it's also a game that I kind of did a let's play of as well. Now this act is very trap heavy and remains probably the hardest stage in the game. Luckily there is a cheeky shortcut you can take right from the start which allows Sonic to totally bypass the mayhem and stressful situations. So from the start of the stage jump at this point here and Sonic will land on the flying platform. Now stay on this platform and jump carefully to the next one etc etc until you are at this point here. I would recommend jumping in between the chains here, not just because you can find a hidden chaos emerald here, more on those later, but you need to be careful as there are a number of gun turrets that shoot out bullets thick and fast. Sonic must get over them quickly and I find just waiting here allows me to visualise what I need to do before making my move. Once you have clambered over them then you have now made it into Robotnik's ship. It's the final act where it's make or break, you must defeat Robotnik here once and for all to free the animals for good and bring peace to Mobius. Now the doctor is hiding on the right side of the screen encased in a glass cylinder and is pushing buttons which turns on and off lightning, which is being conducted by a moving device. He also has access to an instant kill projectile which comes from the top right hand side above him. In the first phase of this battle the trick is to hit him when the lightning is off and before the conductor gets to him. When it does get to him then the lightning automatically turns on and will kill Sonic if he isn't out of the way. Now you can get a few cheeky hits on him here in the beginning to speed things up a bit, however for first timers who may not be sure how to deal with him, I would say just hit him once and then move immediately back to the left hand side of the screen. Now once he has been hit enough times, then the battle changes. Now Robotnik is waiting and trying to bait Sonic by turning the lightning on and off. You have to watch for the timing as it's different and it's easy to get caught out. 
As I mentioned, the lightning flickers on and off more quickly and you must learn this pattern so you can finish off Robotnik. Again, if you get caught by the lightning or the fireballs, then the chances are you will die instantly unless you have been fortunate to get to this point with a ring shield, which bestows Sonic with an extra hit. I should mention that in all Robotnik encounters there are no rings and you have to win this battle by just hitting him and surviving. If you take damage, you will lose a life. This final encounter does feel impossible as it can be hard to see the bigger picture with the evil scientist just taunting you from behind the glass. Once you have the timing down, you can then smash the glass and win the fight. Okay, so this next part contains spoilers, so if you don't want to know what happens, then please skip ahead to the next section. I'll give you some time to do this. Okay, so after smashing the doctor's glass, Robotnik does try and make a break for it by jumping in his teleporter. Sonic quickly follows and we see the doctor trying to get away in his little ship. Sonic though is right behind him and smashes him with a spin attack. The ending here is the good one and occurs when Sonic has collected all six of the Chaos Emeralds which are hidden in each zone. Once this happens they fly in the air and Sonic gets a huge score bonus. The same thing occurs on the normal ending except there's no emeralds and only slightly less of a score bonus. One thing that really annoys me is there's no credit screen and no hidden zones either. All you have is bragging rights. But to be honest, as a little bit disappointing as this was, beating this game is a massive undertaking and it does feel good to finally beat Robotnik's last line of defence. Ok so that's the games tackled, now let's have a look at the power ups Sonic can collect to help him tip the bones in his favour. Firstly, each level is littered with gold rings for him to collect and they yield different results for Sonic. If Sonic is able to collect 100 of these on a level then he gets an extra life. Sonic without any rings is only able to take one hit before he bites the bullet, however if he takes damage whilst he has collected rings then he will flicker and lose the rings but he will still have one more hit. Should he take further damage then he will lose a life, so in short collecting rings gives Sonic an extra hit. Now, if Sonic collects 50 to 99 rings and he hits the signpost at the end of Act 1 or 2 of the first 4 zones, then he will be warped to a special stage where he has a minute to collect as many rings as he can and also extra lives and continues. However, in order to ensure continues are added to your total, you must ensure you get to the end of the stage before time expires. Also, you can only get continues in special stages and so it's worthwhile visiting as many as you can before the game halts you in your tracks to the scrap brain zone because at this point, no matter how many rings Sonic has, there are just no special stages at or after this point. Now the reason I said 50 to 99 rings, not 100, is because that every time Sonic gets 100 rings, the ring counter always resets to zero. So even if you have collected 100 rings and you finish the stage, Sonic won't be warped to the special stage because again the ring counter uh, once it goes over 99 resets to zero despite you collecting all those rings so if you want those special stages then do not exceed 99 rings and finish the act that you are on. I can kind of see how this is annoying but it does empower the player letting them decide whether just collecting lives or investing rings into those bonus stages to earn continues in case things get a little bit tricky later. Also collecting up to 99 rings and then finishing a stage adds points to Sonic's score and for every 50,000 points collected this will earn our hero an extra life. Ok so let's talk a little bit more about special stages themselves. Each one places Sonic in a gorgeous environment chocked full of rings, usually an extra life and a continue. Sonic has one minute to collect as many rings and goodies as possible and is bounced around the ring like a pinball vice which is that propel him upwards at various altitudes. The goal is to collect as much as you can and hit the sign burst at the end. A word of warning, if you collect a continue in the special stage again then you must finish the stage. If Sonic runs out of time it won't be added to his total. As you go through each one they do kind of repeat themselves 
after a while, but they do add in bumpers to try and block Sonic's progress, so it does get quite challenging, especially when you are bouncing up to get an extra life, and have to have a little bit more momentum to be able to move across the screen to the next part. All in all, these are a lot of fun and much better than the special stages found on the Mega Drive version, which kind of makes me feel ill due to their backgrounds. Also, eagle-eyed gamers will be able to spot that some acts even include ring boxes, which if jumped on will give Sonic 10 rings, which will be added to his total. Very handy for anybody who wants more rings to access the special stages. Extra lives can also be earned in the form of mini TVs with the Sonic's face on them, and some of these are scattered through each of the zone's acts. Some are hidden in plain sight, whilst others require a bit of risk taking or exploring to find. Ancient put one in Act 3 of every boss fight, so they are worth tracking down and adding to your total. For first time players may want to gather as many as possible to help them get used to the game's later cool gimmicks. An extra life can also be earned every time Sonic manages to get 50,000 points, so it pays to try and collect as many as possible. If Sonic gets hit and loses his rings and then hits the signpost, he won't get the points because he has no rings, so it pays to try not to get hit by an enemy when you have an excess of valuable rings and make it to the signpost to get as many points as you can muster. So, two hits is not enough? Well, you can potentially increase this total up to three if you can find the shield power-up and provided you collected some rings. Again, once you smash this TV screen with this sort of shield icon on, then a glowing ring of light surrounds Sonic. This means that he is protected unless he takes damage. If this happens, then he will lose it completely. Thankfully, there are a few dotted about in key areas in some of the zones, so there's ample opportunity to find and utilise them. Plus, if you are able to keep them for long periods, then they can help turn the tide in your favour when it comes to fighting Robotnik on any of the six zones. What would the platform game without invincibility? What would the platform game be without invincibility? This power-up gives the speed to the temporary invulnerability from enemies, spikes and gimmicks, allowing him to get through a particularly tough part of a stage. Now, these are extremely rare, and I believe there are only a few of them in the entire game. There's one on the first act of Green Hill Zone, and another one on the second act of Labyrinth. I wasn't, in all of my time playing the game, able to find any more, so this makes it a very rare power-up indeed. The Sneakers now this only appears once in the whole game and can be found in the middle of Green Hill Zone Act 1. Essentially it increases Sonic's speed, allowing him to move a bit faster, but I don't know why there is only one. My best guess is that the developers Ancient might have planned to put more of them in the game until they realised that moving Sonic too fast on an 8-bit system might cause unnecessary deaths, as the level structure and master system limitations does not seem to suit this. Again I'm not knocking the game for this because it works quite well. Anyway, in my opinion, if I am honest, I do find this power up a hindrance, even in the 16-bit Sonic the Hedgehog game as the first one is fast, but not as fast as refined as in the sequels would become. This of course was the first game featuring Sonic, so from this seed an idea would be worked on to build the future Sonic titles. In any case, it's funny to see this power up appear only one time in this version. Ok, so let's talk about the checkpoint item which appears throughout most of the acts. Although technically not a power-up, it does allow Sonic to continue the act from that point, provided he has smashed the icon, so dying after that point means he will lose a life, but he can continue from the checkpoint, meaning he won't have to start the level again. Finally, there is that end of level sign. Sonic must run into it for it to not only finish the act, but occasionally flipping it will give Sonic an extra life or 10 rings. I don't know if this is random or if certain conditions need to be met, but it's so cool when this happens as it feels like the game is rewarding your efforts and it really spurred me on to try to finish it. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are 6 Chaos Emeralds hidden in each zone which don't really give Sonic any new abilities, however collecting all 6 means you can unlock the game's true ending which I've shown you earlier. Unlike the Mega Drive version where the Chaos Emeralds must be found in special stages, this time they're just lying about in the regular acts and are not really all that taxing to find. I thought it was a pretty good idea, to me, to not have them in the special stages and I get the impression that Ancient were trying to make this 8-bit interpretation of Sonic to be different, which was a good move in my opinion. I should mention that acts 1 and 2 of every zone are timed. Should the timer run down and Sonic dies, however moving through each stage is sometimes challenging, but if you keep moving then it's practically impossible to run out of time unless you stand idle for long periods, so in essence the time limit is extremely generous and it never becomes a problem. Graphics and Presentation 
Well, for the Sega Master System's first Sonic the Hedgehog game, the graphics are extremely bright and colourful with some beautiful backgrounds and effects. No two zones look alike and Ancient have really put a good deal of attention and care, ensuring they all look as detailed as possible and really use the colour palette well. I mean, the Sega Master System is half the power of the Mega Drive and the developers realised this and worked hard around these limitations to try and bring Sonic to the 8-bit market. I love the waterfalls in the Lost Green Jungle Zone and although I get toasted by the light and sky base I thought it looked very impressive. In fact I'm blown away by how many cool things Ancient managed to put into this game, in some ways paying homage to the Mega Drive yet also doing its own thing at the same time. As annoying as the Labyrinth Zone can be, it is one gorgeous looking level and it's clear that the developers wanted to give Master System owners a taste of what the Mega Drive players had in the 16-bit version. Sonic's sprite looks like it should and he even acts like a moody teenager when you stand still and his attacks look quite good. Obviously in this interpretation he doesn't have the power of bash processing to allow him to zip through the zones at lightning speed but the game strangely works as a slow down platform game. The items Sonic collects are all easily identifiable from rings to shields to ring boxes and continues. It admittedly lacks the shine and polish of the later Sonic games but this one was the first 8-bit Sonic and so Ancient was slowly realising what could be achieved with the Sega Master System and developers after that kind of improved the games with each release. Unfortunately for Ancient again, to my knowledge they only got two rolls of the dice with our spiky blue hero. They made the Master System version and the Game Gear version which is similar but does have a few differences like a proper ending with credits. Now that was fantastic. Now I have played the Game Gear version and it puts right the few problems that the Master System version had such as the second act of the Jungle Zone again rectifying the fact that now Sonic can move about freely without worrying about the screen killing him. To be honest, although it can seem like a cruel hand dealt to you by the developers, the more you play this game, the more you get used to its tricks and traps. All the Robotnik fights can be quite tense as again Sonic can't just spam him over and over as Robotnik's hitbox can suddenly turn invincible for a, a few seconds. When this is attempted, and because of this, Sonic can die instantly, or take a hit. Graphically it works, and I have to give props to Ancient for the final battle inside the Evil Doctor's airship. I love the effects of the electricity turning on and off, and it's nice to see Robotnik outside of his vehicles. To sum it all up, this is one good looking game and would serve as inspiration for Aspect who developed pretty much nearly every 8-bit Sonic game thereafter. There is of course a few sprite flickers however when some enemies are on screen but this happens only a handful of times. Music and sound effects. Now this is one area where the game really shines. I know that the title screen is a little basic but we do get the Sonic theme lovingly recreated using the Master System's 8-bit sound and also the familiar Green Hill Zone music also. One thing that really stands out for me is that rather than try and compose one thing that really stands out for me is that rather than try and replicate some of the zone's themes from the 16-bit version, Ancient have composed their own, and this was very noticeable on the Labyrinth and Jungle Zone. Or how about Bridge Zone's upbeat chirpy music? It sounds very similar to Janet Jackson's Together Again, and I love that song also, so it's a win-win for me, and to be honest I never really noticed until it was pointed out by YouTube. In fact, every track is memorable and gets stuck in your head, and I applaud the very talented musicians at Ancient. The sound effects are also very good, crisp and clear, and you instantly know if you were hit, collected rings, bashed a baddie, or jumped up to a new platform. It's so difficult for me to critique the music or the sounds because they truly are amazing. In-game story and cutscenes. Whilst there are very few cutscenes and very little text, which was the norm in 8-bit platform games, for the most part it's easy to know what is happening the more progress is made, and it follows a pattern whereby Sonic must conquer two acts of each zone, and then on the third, face Robotnik in a boss battle, so Sonic is primarily telling the story as you guide him through the game. When you encounter Robotnik, you know that he has trapped animals in a capsule, and you must defeat him to free them. Once this is achieved, then Sonic must press a button on the capsule and free the animals and move on to the next zone. It's the sort of game where the story in the manual sort of tells it all, and the little encounters with Robotnik and the harsher obstacles in the later zones reveal the plot, in that Sonic is chasing the Mad Doctor throughout each zone, and it all ends once he reaches Robotnik's deadly airship. So the story is very simple, but executed extremely well by you, the player, and the further you get, the more of the story you tell. I do love how each time I fight Robotnik's harder battles that he's always trying to outdo Sonic, and I do imagine the two having a war of words whilst duking it out. Controls. Well, Sonic controls extremely well in 16-bit and works just as well in 8. 
pressing left to right moves the blue blur around in that direction. If you hold down, you can curl into a ball. Now if you curl into a ball right after Sonic has run, then you can roll into baddies or use certain slopes to roll and get a bit more of momentum to get higher. Whilst this is a cool thing to be able to do, I just don't feel overall that the game is designed to move quickly without there being consequences, such as Sonic landing on spikes or in a bottomless pit. This is not a knock at this game again by any means, but the 16-bit Sonic levels were built to utilise for the most part Sonic's fast-paced gameplay and speed. This 8-bit interpretation is more akin to traditional platform games such as Mario and uses the same kind of rules and that's not a bad thing because as I said before this game works so well in this style and I forgot about the lack of speed because the core gameplay is just so good. Pressing button 1 or 2 will make Sonic spin attack and this is his signature manoeuvre that you will be using to kill enemies, to jump up to higher platforms and to jump and use switches and also to collect power ups and rings in the air. Also if Sonic is standing still you can make him nod his head by pressing up over and over. It looks amazing and I like to do it with the timing of the music that's playing to look like he's jamming to it. The controls are extremely responsive and work well, not an example of how to control a character in a 2D video game. With all the levels and gimmicks it's easy to steady Sonic and if you die and make an error then 9 times out of 10 it was your fault. I have no issues with them whatsoever. Overall. Sonic the Hedgehog for the Sega Master System is without a doubt a quality platform game and succeeds remarkably, even though the blue speed still has lost its trademark speed, which in many ways was the element that made the Mega Drive version such a fantastic game. Ancient wisely created a straightforward platform game with Sonic which takes bits from the 16-bit version, mixes it into a blender with some original zones of their own, and the game just works. It does have its issues with some stages leading you to tear your hair out, I'm talking about you Skybase, however the game gives you ample opportunity to farm for lives and continue so that you can at least have multiple attempts at certain difficult stages, but with some perseverance and practice it's possible to beat this game quite quickly once you know what you're doing. Again, I do take issue with the auto scroll levels, I can't quite understand why they were included and only serve to hinder what is already a really good 8 bit gem. I could live with the bridge zone at 2's screen forcing slightly forward, but I take a great deal of annoyance with Act 2 with the jungle zone. I don't feel that it was necessary to have the screen push you upwards with no place to land, and it just comes across as cruel, so, as Sonic is climbing up the waterfall anyway. Again, the Game Gear version does not have the screen killer in Jungle Zone, it's much more enjoyable for it. Nevertheless, can I recommend this title? Absolutely. It's a fine first foray for Sonic in 8-bit and a very well crafted platform game that is just as playable now as it was back in the 90s. The controls, music and sound are top notch and with original tunes and clear thought from Ancient. This is just one absolutely amazing debut for Sonic on the Master System. So with that being said, I give Sonic the Hedgehog a spintastic 4.5 and a half out of 5. Some people might not like a Sonic game being chopped in half with no speed, but make no mistake, this Hedgehog might be chugging along, but he has plenty of attitude charm and is just as cool as in the 16-bit version, and this is reflected in the beautifully designed platform stages which actually work with these limitations. <laughs>